Let's go to that gospel reading that we just heard from the Apostle John in chapter 7. And this opportunity that Jesus gives to us to explain what the Holy Spirit, whose presence, whose given presence we celebrate today on this Pentecost Sunday, uh, what the Holy Spirit is, is meant to be like for us in our lives. God, the Father's intention, the, the Son giving us the presence of the Spirit, what this Spirit is meant to be in our lives as we receive Him, as people of faith. Jesus is in the temple courts, and we pick it up in verse 37, where we hear that on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice. Now, let's give us some context here. The last day of this great festival that we're talking about, John is recording that this is the third of the three great festivals that the Israelites would celebrate. This festival is called the Festival of Tabernacles, or we would know it as the Festival of Booths. And what this festival celebrated were a couple of things. One, it was a spiritual uh, uh, pointing for them to God's activity in the Israelites' life as he cared for them When they came out of captivity in Egypt, through the wilderness wanderings, bringing them to the promised land. And the significance of this festival of booths during the time of the year, it was typically celebrated in the middle of October, was also the the celebration of the inbringing of the harvest. And so the Israelites could relate, God has provided for us, look at this rich harvest that we're enjoying, and... As we know, we can recount in our history that he's provided for us in our wilderness wanderings, and we're here today because of that provision. So the people would build these temporary booths, houses, tabernacles, all around the countryside in Jerusalem, little makeshift tents in which they would live in for about a week or so. And every day, the Israelites then would go to the temple courts, And the festival of booths would be celebrated. The priest, the high priest, would take a golden pitcher and he would go to the pool of Siloam. So he would walk down from the temple to the pool of Siloam and he would dip this golden pitcher into the water. He would walk back up the the temple stairs and all the while the people would be reciting from Isaiah the coming of the salvation in the Messiah, the Messiah. They would be celebrating in the Psalms, pour out your salvation upon us, Lord. And that priest would take them, this golden pitcher, and pour out the water on the altar there in the temple courts. Great spiritual, visual significance. But, as John says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, this would have been the seventh day of this festival, not just one time did the priest go down and the, the high priest go down and dip water out of the pool of Siloam seven times. He would march back and forth, the people singing and praising the Lord as the significance of water pouring out on the altar of God's provision. Water is life. It was that, we think, we can make a, 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 a theological best guess here putting in all of this context together of why John records this in this particular way, that seventh time that the priest is pouring the water, that Jesus shouts out in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. (laughs) Uh, Putting that high priest in place, putting the ritual of the celebration into a new context. Jesus is saying, look, you want to have living water for life? Isn't that reminiscent of the woman at the, uh, the well in Samaria? Well, she asks, where can I get this living water? And Jesus says, you're looking at it. I'm here. Take a drink of me. Well, Jesus says, anyone who's thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Jesus is promising life in water, the Holy Spirit. And by this, we're told, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. For up to that point in time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. This is the context in which we're celebrating 
the gift of the Holy Spirit as Jesus promised it to us on this day of Pentecost. Sure, it came down on the disciples' heads the day of Pentecost as they were gathered in that upper room in Jerusalem like little flames of fire. Sure, it, the Spirit manifested itself in that way. Here Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit like water. Water, which is crucial to life. You know, our bodies are made up of 90% some water, and, and we need water. To, we need to take in water to keep living and stay alive and replenish that, which, that water that is given off in, in sweat and energy as we live. And water also is needed to make clean. How many of you have washed your hands more in the last two and a half months than you have in your whole life, right? We're learning all about that, yeah. Needing to wash to stay clean. Clean. Now, there's great significance in this idea of being taken in, water that's taken in, and uh, water that washes and cleanses. Uh, think, about, uh, think about what Peter says of what water is like. It's like our baptism. Comparing it to Noah and the flood, where the Lord took in Noah and his family, saving them through water, which symbolizes baptism, Peter says, because water was also used to cleanse his creation, wipe out all that was evil so a new creation could come forth. The Israelites knew all about that kind of water in which they would be taken in, this incredible water tunnel. Moses stretched his arm out, and the Red Sea parted. The land was dry, and the Israelites crossed over with their enemies behind them. When they got to the other side, Moses stretched out his arm again, and a cleansing of water happened. All the Egyptians were, were killed. All that would want to take the Israelites' lives were wiped out. And they got to this place called Marabah, and they were thirsty. And God said to Moses, strike the rock, touch it with your rod, and water will come forth. The uh, oddest place for water to come forth, a rock? And Moses did, and God provided life-giving water. We know about this. The Israelites knew about this. For Jesus to stand up and say, anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink, is giving to us a whole new truth, perspective, about who he is and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. That living water that Jesus is talking about is the Holy Spirit. John talks about that. By this he meant the Spirit. And will flow from within them is then the description of the working of the Holy Spirit. As you and me know Jesus Christ, believe in him, we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's like a, a, a living stream within us now. And that Holy Spirit comes out and makes itself manifest in our lives like a flowing river flowing out from us. That's nothing we do. We choose. We can't help it. It's but the power of God at work in us as his people, as Jesus has promised. Now, this is going to bring two kinds of responses. And we hear it in the word. Go to verse 40. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet, the promised one. And others said, even more specifically, He is the Mashiach, the promised, the anointed one of God, the Messiah. So on the one hand, there's that acknowledgement by the Spirit that this is God's Son, our Savior, Jesus. We welcome you, and we want to follow you. And then there's the other response. A response that clearly shows that the Spirit is not present and is not at work, at least at this point in time, in somebody. For in verse 41, we hear, still others asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? So there was still a little bit of doubt there. Even when there's a little bit of doubt, the Lord can do a lot with us. Thomas is a great example of that. But when, when doubt causes a division, when unbelief causes a, decision, a division, verse 43 picks it up saying, the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him. They wanted to dispose, get rid of him. They didn't want anything to do with him. And so it seems that as the Spirit is seeking to work, there's two responses that come from people. A desire to follow and walk in Jesus' ways and a rejection of that. You know, each day, our lives are a little microcosm of that. 
Because while we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, while we live in the presence and the power of his spirit, that doggone sinful nature of ours battles against that river of life. It wants to, to dam it up or, 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 or send it off in another direction, an un, ungodly direction. And so we stumble and fall in our sinfulness and block the spirit's working as if we're saying like these people, I don't want to follow Jesus in this particular way. It's why we come to him for forgiveness and repentance. It's why we are eager to hear those words of forgiveness so that that which is given to us might be reestablished in our ears, our hearts, our minds, our lives. And reestablished then to carry on the work of our Savior Jesus as he's working in us. What's interesting here in verse 44, as John relates to us, is that as all of this was going on, no one laid a hand on Jesus. Those are significant words for us. They may seem real simple and easy, and, we, and in fact, in our reading, just kind of pass over, gloss over them, but there's significance there. And this is why. At that point in time, Jesus' mission had not yet been complete. So for him to be allowed to have hands laid on him for what they wanted to do to him would mean that his mission would not have been completed. His work on the cross for our forgiveness. His work in being brought back to life by his Father for our salvation and victory in his resurrection. And what we celebrated last week in his ascension, that his mission wouldn't have reached its fulfillment as he took his, father, uh, took his rightful place at his Father's right hand. All of this had to happen so that we could be here today celebrating the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Nobody laid a hand on him at that point in time until the Father was ready. Until the sacrificial lamb's time had come. Until all that was appointed was in place. And Jesus would give himself willingly to be killed, to suffer and die, to be buried for you and me. That the Holy Spirit might come. That today we can celebrate the presence of the Spirit within us. That we know the Spirit, like a, a living water flowing within us, moves out from us as we go into the world. Rivers of living water, Jesus said, will flow from within you. Ah, the English doesn't do it justice. From within. You know what that word really is? Your belly. <laughs> from within you. It's the word koilias. It, it's, it's the seat, as the Israelites understood, of our passions. Uh, of our emotions and our, uh, our desires, that which moves us in life, that which causes us to pursue something in life. It comes from within, your kailios, your belly. And Jesus says, look, as I take residence in you through the Holy Spirit, rivers of living water are going to flow from that place, that seat in which your passions and emotions and your desires long to follow. And that's what's been renewed for us. We're no longer of the world. We've died to that. Now we are in Christ Jesus. And what I desire, what we long for, what we're passionate about, right, is his people. Do this for me, because I can't tell with your masks on. If you're passionate about this, pull your mask down and give me some kind of facial expression, right? Yeah, are we passionate? Yeah, we're passionate about this. For this is our life in Christ Jesus. But what moves us? It move, it's what moved those disciples on that very first Pentecost Sunday. That Pentecost day in which the Spirit came down like tongues of fire. In which they were enabled to do in a, 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 an ignited passion, a drive. Enabled to do something that they would never would have thought possible of their own doing. But which the Spirit enabled them to do. They began to speak as we're told in verse 4. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They were speaking in a language that all the people, the Medes, the Cyrenes, the Mesopotamians, who were gathered there in Jerusalem for the festival of booths, could now understand in their own language what the disciples were talking about. What they were talking about was this one who is the water of life, Jesus. Do you think those disciples could ever have done that on their own? They never went to language school, but the Holy Spirit enabled them. 
And then we have the example of Peter in verse 14. For Peter stood up with the eleven, he raised his voice, and he addressed the crowd. And he spoke to them about this Mashiach, who is Jesus the Savior, glorified now at the Father's right hand. And his spirit is at work within us. Friends, you might have the spirit nudging you right now in some ways that you never thought possible. Imagine possible that you don't even know you can do you can block that that's disappointing to the spirit or we can step out in faith holy spirit use me the way you want to use me i don't know if it's going to be speaking in a, a different language so somebody can understand the gospel maybe maybe you want me to address crowds i don't know i don't know if i can do that maybe or maybe it's a hundred other kinds of ways in which the Spirit is nudging you to step out in faith so that that river of life, Jesus himself and the Holy Spirit, might flow from you to the blessing of our God and the blessing of those who get to know you. Blessed Pentecost, in that water of life, Jesus, who replenishes us on the inside so that we might take him to the world the outside our lives renewed in the holy spirit jesus our savior come and let's pray our heavenly father how good you are to us in the blessing of not only the salvation that we know in christ the lord your promised messiah the son but that that spirit of power and life now is ours as well and flows from us as you will and choose whether it's like those 11 proclaiming the good news in the language they never knew, or Peter even doing something beyond his wildest dreams, uh, addressing a large crowd. Lord, whatever it is that you're calling us to do, you nudge us by that spirit and move us in obedience, in love for you, in a desire, a passion, a koilias from our belly to walk in your ways, to show your glory. We love you, Lord, because you have first loved us and can't wait for you to use us Proclaim the love of Jesus. In his name we praise you and we pray. Amen. May the peace of God that passes our understanding, my friends, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, to the glory and praise of his name as he lives in you.